thank you very much for joining us today. It's really an honor to have the opportunity to speak to you today. And one of our goals is to really understand how the foundation and the department began to work together in partnership to start the Pickering Fellowship, which has had such an impact on so many students and so many foreign service officers. So I, I think it would be great to begin by understanding that story. How did the foundation become involved with the Department of State in this program, and what specifically was your role in that process? Mm -hmm. well, well, first, uh, I'm very honored to talk to you about this, and it's wonderful to see um, one of, uh, shall we say, the fellows <laughs> become a very successful uh, Foreign Service officer, and congratulations you. on your work. <clears throat> The uh, Pickering Fellowship began as a Foreign Affairs Fellows program. And um, prior to that, um, I had been uh, talking to a, a lot of different uh, people about programs that would put international affairs more prominently. Because at, uh, at one time, uh, uh, Robert Goheen, who uh, was president of Princeton University, uh, was also the president of Woodrow Wilson Foundation. And he was, uh, he was at one time a, an ambassador himself and was very interested in international affairs. And I was interested in international affairs relative to the participation of underrepresented individuals uh, in the Foreign Service and other programs. And so I had been speaking around to various groups uh, in the community uh, about this. And uh, I <clears throat> developed a friendship with John Gravely in, in a community affairs program. And he and I were talking about this idea of expanding uh, international affairs. And he was at that time in the Foreign Service and working with the Director General of the Foreign Service. Uh, <clears throat> and it's a very long story short, but he, he, he uh, sort of opened my eyes to the possibility of this kind of program happening with the State Department. And uh, I <clears throat> was asked by Ambassador Perkins uh, to talk with the State Department, and I, had, and there were hundreds of small groups that I had to talk to or convince them that this might be a good idea, and so ultimately, um, <clears throat> this prevailed, and and so the uh, international affairs underrepresented component uh, became a part. Uh, of this uh, far, uh, Foreign Affairs Fellows Program. And uh, it was later that Ambassador Pickering uh, was asked, because he is such a stellar uh, Foreign Service officer himself, would he mind his name being attached to this? And of course he was very honored to, to do that. And he still, he participates to this day. Uh, he will be meeting on Monday. With the, with the uh, folks uh, to celebrate the, the first ambassador coming out of this uh, program. And so <clears throat> my uh, uh, role was to get it done and convince people that this was important, uh, conceptualize how this uh, program might go. So uh, that was sort of the early part of it. Right. So that's really interesting. Kind of building on that, what were some of the significant challenges or obstacles that you faced as you <clears throat> kind of engaged with the department to build the program and then later started your outreach efforts to, to students and uh, at universities? Uh, one of the challenges was the outreach, actually. And uh, it's, it was fortunate that uh, I went to Morehouse College in Atlanta and uh, there were uh, many underrepresented individuals that I grew up with, basically, and uh, we were using um, the uh, historically black colleges, historically 
Hispanic colleges, etc., as a particular pool from which we could enjoy, uh, join uh, applicants. <clears throat> but it wasn't easy, because you can imagine um, that people were saying, foreign service? What do you do with foreign service? Do you make money? <laughs> you know, what's, what's the role of, of, of the foreign service? So the convincing part was extremely important. And then uh, there were individuals who did not want this kind of program to happen. And uh, so where I couldn't convince them, I had to look for other avenues uh, uh, of interest. And I was was able to do so, and we sort of uh, like snowballed over time. Um, it became something that uh, a lot of folks uh, began to see. Oh, that's what you do, you know. Mm -hmm. And you're overseas, and you you speak different languages, mm -hmm. and uh, it became very interesting. You're talking to a lot, a lot of folks. Uh, convincing them. And of course then the money part you had to get. Uh, and we were fortunate in that we uh, had a lot of support from the Mellon Foundation mm -hmm. and from Carnegie and Ford and helped us in uh, various programs. Uh, as, as, and we sort of set up a consortium of uh, foundations that would be interested in this kind of thing um, and began to sort of develop an interest that way as well. So you've had such an impact and it's clear that so many different things have influenced you. If historians were looking back and they had researched you and they had researched the Pickering program, what mark have you left on that program that would make them say, that's definitely the influence of Dr. Hope? Mm -hmm. what, what is it that you think that you've brought to the program stands out as something that, that is an important mark for you in the program? I, I think uh, <clears throat> the models that I've used uh, in establishing these various programs to include the Pickering mm -hmm. uh, and to ensure the success of these programs uh, I made sure that the programs are longitudinal, that is, that they're not, they're not one-shot deal, but all of the, the programs that uh, I started are multi-year programs, and uh, preferably degree granting all the way through. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, starting early, uh, as early as you can, um, with individuals uh, so that you can have a, a, a pretty good uh, idea of where the youngster is coming from and the kinds of influences uh, you can have on him. Most importantly, the mentoring. There has to be more than just a classroom situation. There has to be individuals who come to them and uh, individuals they recognize as relevant uh, and they look like them and and so the, the whole range of uh, influences <clears throat> to see that well maybe you know I can do this too and I found something that was, was surprising what I call cohort identity that is uh, say the Pickering uh, fellows uh, in many ways have been successful because they have friends and brothers and sisters <laughs> to talk to and say, do you know what I heard yesterday? <laughs> you know, <laughs> a kind of a place to, to not only uh, get some solace, but also to get some ideas because uh, they were all in various locations. Um, and so the, the idea of having this identity with the students uh, is very helpful. The fellowship itself be long term. In other words, you're not funding individuals for six months. 
the uh, experiential learning that is you're sort of involved in um, situations where uh, you're not just using school books but you are working uh, in that situation like the summer institutes yes. and uh, uh, and you were sort of thrown in there to, to produce something real yes. and and uh, <clears throat> And public service is finally that I would. I always wanted to make sure that uh, uh, people involved in uh, these various programs uh, felt that they were doing something higher than themselves. That they it was not just yes, sure you you'll get a good job, you'll get you make money and all the rest of it. But what how is that helping the society? Uh, should you be involved in helping society? And these various programs were very much, uh, uh, in fact, you might remember some of my speeches to you yes, where, yes, <laughs> where I said you have a wonder, wonderful opportunity, but you also have a wonderful responsibility, you know, to bring up uh, youngsters, your brothers and sisters. I don't know if you remember any of those yes, speeches. I do. I, do. <laughs> I definitely remember them. So, Anyway, I, I could go on, but th that's that would be, uh, I think, one of the uh, unique aspects of the programs. No, I think that's really profound. I know that I draw on my yeah. internship experience, my summer institute experience, I, I, all the time in my regular work, and I regularly rely on the counsel and advice of my cohort mm -hmm. and the cohorts near me. I, I think that all many of the aspects mm -hmm. of the model that you've highlighted have directly related to, I know, my success and certainly many other fellows as well. So it's interesting that you raise kind of many of these viewpoints and these ideas and it, it, it's, I'm curious as you look back over your career and you think about uh, the future of the program and the, and the future of uh, the department, what advice would you give to fellows, um, the current cohorts now as they are going through the program? The important thing is to uh, continue the, the, the cohort identity, the relationships that you developed over the years, because that, that is sort of your union card, you know. Uh, yeah. It becomes a, a, a real source of strength, uh, not just for you, but for, for the group, because trust me, everybody else has had similar kinds of problems. and. Um, uh, Continue to to reach out for uh, resources to individuals who are interested in the work that you're doing and getting keeping them sort of alert and uh, involved in what you're doing so so that they know um, uh, what's going on um, and I, I'm well as you know I'm a sociologist but I, I believe in institutionalization. That is, if the program is successful, it should be institutionalized. And what does that mean? It means that the uh, organization itself should continue to support it and that it continue to, to run. And very often uh, there are times when these institutions, such as the State Department, uh, are uh, they're going to have some poor leadership or leadership that have other interests only to have this uh, be the, the product of one of their uh, to eliminate and uh, so the the question of uh, continuing uh, the support uh, in other words not just your job but continuing uh, support uh, generally from the various institutions. As you think about what our audience takes away from this discourse today, I know certainly one thing that really has struck me is this idea that programs to be successful should be both sustainable but also have the potential to grow and, and impact others. Mm -hmm. But if you had some takeaways that you wanted people to understand about uh, the foundation, about the Pickering program and about its role in the State Department, well, what would those be? 
I think different uh, levels. Uh, one, I, I would hope that the Woodrow Wilson Foundation would continue its very strong legacy in international affairs programs, one, which started right after Second World War um, and uh, with uh, uh, past president uh, Robert Goheen as uh, one of the founders. And uh, to continue the tradition of uh, having a very strong connection between uh, the universities and uh, international affairs and the various institutions that uh, could use the services of these and have it institutionalized so that uh, uh, my leaving or your leaving or whoever, that these programs will continue. And most importantly, to be able to, <coughs> excuse me, to, to go to uh, the unsung communities, uh, coal mine neighborhoods. Uh, one of my best uh, buddies came out of the coal mines of the mountains there. Uh, and I got him involved in one of these programs. And, and he has, the, you know, the, the, the typical twang, you know, sound. And people said, no, he can't be serious, you know. But uh, he's probably more interested in doing some of these things than others. Uh, but going to, to uh, where minorities and women are least involved in these programs and make them aware of the opportunities where they can help, uh, help this country. Uh, that, and, and again, to have these uh, institutionalized uh, uh, programs. Uh, there should be uh, people from the Foreign Service who regularly go to these underrepresented uh, communities to talk about that. Now, I know they, they still do that, but not as much as they uh, uh, used to. Uh, but that, that uh, continue uh, in, a, in, a, in a major way. Of course. Yeah. So I, I think um, maybe I would close this portion of our discussion with uh, the question, as you look back on the program and your engagement with state, what are you most proud of? Uh, that it happened. <laughs> because I can't tell you how many of my friends saying, oh, Richard, this is, a, this is not gonna go, you know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And to have it to become a very successful program and, and to have the products of these programs shall we say, provable geniuses, provable people who are out uh, uh, solving the problems of the United States and the world. Uh, I'd like to go back and, and, <laughs> and uh, talk to these people now, you know, yeah. and say, you know, here's, here's what's possible. Uh, but I think that uh, uh, it's important that uh, these kinds of programs uh, continue in, in whatever way. Well, Dr. Hope, I think that I speak for all of the fellows when I say thank you for your commitment and your perseverance and your patience in developing this program and pushing all of us to be our best and setting us up for success and overcoming what must have seemed at the time as impossible hurdles. And I hope that you see that it was worth it and that every day we go to work all over the world and we leave it all in the field we give it our best to try to make you proud and to try to serve our country so thank you very much well thank you and congratulations on your wonderful success thank you